Hi everybody, my name is Shanice Johnson and I am the proud Vice President of Our Community Reads. I am a single mom of three. I went to Damon J. Keith Elementary School on the east side of Detroit and I grew up born and raised in the city. And I graduated from Finney High School in class of 1996, don't count how many years that is. And I also am a Eastern Michigan University graduate with a bachelor's in liberal arts and am pursuing my master's degree in education with a concentration in English. Today I'm going to read a book about a black legend. Not Malcolm X, not Martin Luther King, and not Rosa Parks. Not discounting their historical landmarks, but I'm going to read today about a legendary actress that a lot of people, young scholars like yourself, don't know about. Her name is Miss Lena Horne, and she was a beautiful actress who made her way into the film industry when black people were not allowed to be on screen. Introducing Miss Lena Horne by Carol Boston Weatherford, and the art was created by Elizabeth Zunin. Look at this pretty, this is nice, isn't it, y'all? This nice little red going on here. These are the dedications to her mother, Carolyn, who defies beauty, dignity, and strength, and to all the little girls and boys dreaming big dreams. This is a quote I want you guys never to forget, including us adults. You have to be taught to be second class. You're not born that way. And I'm going to read that again because that's a statement. You have to be taught to be second class. You are not born that way. So little scholars, remember that. You are not second class kids. The Horn family tree was laden with achievers, teachers, activists, a Harlem Renaissance poet, a dean of a black college, and Lena's grandmother, Cora Calhoun Horn, a college graduate. So what this book is already starting out saying that Black people are achievers. We're not just regular people working nine to five jobs. You can actually make this a legacy of your own tree. You see all these people here? These people are educated black people just like you. And they have made their tree full of legacies. As you can see, teachers, activists, poets, the dean of a college, which means you run the college. That's what a dean means, y'all. And a college graduate. So you don't work hard and you can be one of these people. Lena's father, Teddy, had other ideas. A street hustler. He lived long, he lived high on the hog, had fine clothes and fancy cars, and never went to jail. And eventually owned a hotel and a restaurant. Lena's mother, Edna, was an actress and a touring trope. The day Lena arrived, Teddy bet on a card game to pay the hospital bill. So basically, kids, what this book is saying is, you know, he was a little street hustler. You know, he wasn't, you know, real honest, but he didn't go to jail and he turned his street hustle into an owner. So he owned his own hotel and restaurant. Y'all see that here? He owned a hotel and a restaurant. He started out here and y'all know what a street hustler is, but he ended up here. So that's that's possible. <laughs> Amen. Started from the bottom to the top. That's what that's what they that's what he did. That's what Lee, that's what Lee the Daddy did. Born June 30th, 1917, in Brooklyn. Native New Yorker Lena Horn was born into the freedom struggle. At two, she became not just one of the youngest members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which is the NAACP, but also a cover girl for the NAACP branch bulletin. And that's little Lena here. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. These are the first uh, three lyrics to the Negro National Black Anthem. So in case y'all didn't know, black people have their own anthem, y'all. So we're going to talk about that another time. When Lena was barely a toddler, Teddy left for Pittsburgh and turned his smarts to becoming a gambling kingpin. Her stage-struck mother hit the road, too. Little Lena stayed with her grandmother, Cora, in the family's four-story Brooklyn townhouse 
And back then, those used to be, well, they expensive now. Now, it's hard. I think they expensive. I'm not sure. Cora had high standards and drilled in Talena good manners, black pride, and the value of a well-rounded education. She learned to read before kindergarten. Books were her lifelong love and haven from hardship and heartache. Cora enrolled Lena in drama and dance lessons, but would not hear of a show business career. Not for respectable folks, Cora said. Cora had high hopes for her granddaughter, but at a tender age, Lena got toted along as her mother chased bit parts in vaudeville. Lena lived out of a suitcase, shut up between relatives, boarding houses, and homes that took in children for pay. Being on the road with her mother was rough, especially down south. Lena's shoes never fit and her feet always hurt because stores did not let blacks try on shoes before buying. A black cast member was lynched and a black guest was beaten at the rooming house where Lena and her mother were staying. Lena longed for home. Lynched means um, there was something that black people, especially down south, experience and it was a horrible horrible thing that black people went through down south in the Jim Crow days. Back under Cora's ring in Brooklyn, Lena attended an integrated all-girls school, one of the city's best, enjoyed a debutante social club. During the Great Depression, Lena left school and moved in with her mother and new stepfather, both jobless, so neither one of them had no money. As money ran out and bread lines grew, Lena's mother decided to put her on stage. Brother, can you spare a dime? Which was a, was a depression era song, which means these were songs that people were singing as they were waiting in the line to get food assistance. Lena auditioned at, at the fabled Cotton Club. That was a hot spot for us. Harlem's hottest night spot had valet parking, sizzling black music reviews, waltzing raiders, and no mingling between the black performers and the all-white audience. I had no talent, said Lena. All I had was looks. Just a team. Lena sat shade into the chorus line. Band leaders Duke Ellington, who was also a legend, and Cab Calloway, who was another legend, were now her teachers. Edna chaperoned and coached Lena with singing. Before long, Lena leaped from the chorus line to Broadway in Dance With Your Gods. Then came a singing and dancing gig with the Noble Sizzle Society Orchestra. Classy as they were, the black band still had to enter white ballrooms through the back door and could not stay at white hotels. For a place to sleep after shows, band members had to scout for black families willing to take in a few musicians for a night. With Sizzle, 18-year-old Lena cut her first record, I Take to You. Lena took the spotlight so well that she was soon fronting an all-white big band, one of the first black vocalists to do so. Touring with the Charlie Barnett Orchestra, was far from glamorous though. Lena was banned from the bandstand between numbers. Restaurants refused to serve her and hotels refused her rooms and she slept in the bus until Barnett got wise. He began introducing her as Cuban, but that didn't take the sting out of racism. Well, Lena headlined the nightclub by West, Hollywood studio execs caught her act. She had already starred in a couple of low-budget films, including The Duke is Tops. Now, MGM was offering something more, a studio contract, the first ever for a black actress. So we breaking boundaries, y'all. Told y'all she was, a, she was a, a breaker. She did that. She was the first ever black actress to star in the MGM studio. But the NAACP wanted Lena not only to command a paycheck, 
but to demand respect. With the civil rights group behind her, Lena waged a one-woman war against stereotypes by refusing to play maids and mammies on screen. NAACP leaders hoped Lena could change the way that whites saw African Americans. Yeah, I do that too. I don't want to be mammy either. Respectable roles, though, were few for black actresses. So Lena was cast instead in singing numbers that could easily snip from films when shown in the South, so as not to defy racist views. Lena dubbed herself a butterfly pinned to a column. She did not get to fly in black films like Cabin in the Sky and Stormy Weather, whose title song became her anthem. Even in black and white movies, this butterfly dazzled. Ain't it the truth? Lena's song from Cabin in the Sky. Lest Lena be mistaken on screen for white, Max Factor created makeup just to darken her skin. Then she lost roles to white actresses who wore her makeup to play light-skinned black woman. Mm. Black moviegoers didn't have it any better than Lena. Southern theaters that didn't bar blacks made them use a colored entrance, sit in the balcony, or wait for midnight screenings. They didn't make me into a maid, but they didn't make me into anything else either. Quote, Lena Horne. I like that, y'all. I'm going to read that again. They didn't make me into a maid, but they didn't make me into anything else either. Y'all remember that. Keep that in mind. Although Lena despised Jim Crow law, she did, she did her part for the war effort singing on armed force radio shows. But even the military was segregated. Just as there were separate bathrooms, water fountains, and waiting rooms in the South, there were separate shows, one for black troops and another one for whites. At one venue, Lena was denied a cup of coffee but was asked for autographs on her way out. At another, German prisoners of war were seated in front of black soldiers. The, that indignity was too much for Lena to swallow. She was fed up with the whites only clubs and theaters. So she paid her own way to perform for black troops. She paid many visits to the base in Alabama where the famed Tuskegee Airmen were training to become the first black military aviators. After World War II, Lena's ties to outspoken activists like entertainer Paul Robeson and civil rights leader W.E.B. Du Bois got her blacklisted. Though not a communist, she couldn't get work in Hollywood, not during Senator Joe McCarthy's Red Scare. She sang at President Truman's inaugural ball just the same. By then, Lena had married and divorced and had two children to feed. She had to work. You got babies, singer Billie Holiday once told her. You got to pay your rent. Like Cora said, never let anyone see you cry. Lena kept her tears and her love life to herself. In 1947, she married Lenny Hayton, a white music director for MGM. They married in Paris, France, because many states in the U.S. did not allow interracial marriage. Lena and Lenny did not announce their marriage for three years. She later said that she married him to advance her career, but she learned to love him. With Lenny at her side, Lenny, Lena toured nightclubs and became an international star. In 1957, her name off the blacklist Lena cut records, sang on TV, and starred on Broadway, but her most important work lay ahead. At a 1963 rally in Mississippi, civil rights leader Medgar Evers, Lena sang the spiritual, This Little Light of Mine. She found not 
just her voice but a calling, her light. Days later, Evers was slain. Down but unbowed, Lena drew on her freedom fighting roots. She took time off from the stage and screen to join the civil rights movement. She sang at rallies for the National Council of Negro Women. At the March on Washington, where Dr. King gave his famous speech, I Have a Dream speech, Lena spoke one word into the microphone. Freedom! In this battle, Lena was just not a pretty face. She was a foot soldier. We shall overcome the civil rights movement protest him. Eventually, the star returned to the silver screen as Glenda, the good witch in The Wiz, and to Broadway in an award-winning one-woman show. Lena even sang on Sesame Street to a certain green frog. That is Kermit the Frog. I grew up <laughs> on Sesame Street, y'all. I know that frog anywhere. <laughs> it wasn't easy being an ebony queen. Lena's life was not without sad notes. In 1967, she lost her dearest friend, composer and pianist Billy Strayhorn. And in 1971, she lost her father, son, and husband all in the same year. Lena was so down, the only way she could go was up. She stayed in and lost herself in books. <laughs> then music saved her. Lena remembered what band leader Count Bassey, jazz royalty himself, had told her years earlier. They don't give us a chance very often, and when they do, we have to take it. Lena seized every opportunity to, to shine. Her crown, silvery gray. Lena kept cutting records and winning praise. Grammy and Tony Awards, a Kennedy Center honor, honorary degrees from Howard University and Yale, and a place in a big band and jazz hall of fame. All these awards she got. And she was up there, y'all. You see that silvery gray? Lena's, Lena Horne's pioneering performances, her fight on the front lines of the freedom struggle, the racial barriers that she broke, and her fiery pride form her legacy. Because Lena refused to darken rear doors, Black stars now gleam on red carpets and reap box office gold. So she paved the way for Halle Berry. I know y'all know Halle Berry, Halle Berry. Jennifer Hudson, I love her. And is that Nellie? That's Nellie Cole. Nellie Cole. Who else? And the Supremes. She paved the way for all these women and groups. The end. Thank you for reading the legendary Miss Lena Horn with me. This is a classic piece and I really enjoy reading this for you. And I hope you uh, enjoy reading this book with me and I hope that you engaged, you were engaged with the book as I was. And I learned a lot about Miss Lena Horn in this book. So please, please read about Miss Lena Horn. She is a historical timeless classic. Thank you.